Everybody, this is Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel once again, bringing a program which is devoted to painting and drawing from life. When I do scenes and landscapes, the best that we can do about getting working from life is to go out with a video camera and find a spot, shoot the spot for 45 minutes or so, and then do some close-ups and then bring it back into the gallery, I mean into the studio here, and work from the monitor, which is what you will see when the scene is shown. And um, this is a scene picked on the south shore of our viewing district, which is known as the Cap Tree Boat Basin. It's in the Great South Bay. It's quite a wonderful scene, um, very mysterious in its own way, but very typically Long Island. Now, the colors are muted because of the time of year and also because of the place that it's at. There's no swimming allowed here, but there is boating and lots of fishing. So. Uh, looking at it, the, the, the object in the far distance there, which appears somewhat to be a triple image, is the uh, Jones Beach Lighthouse. It's a black, white, black and white striped uh, structure, which everybody is familiar with, I'm sure, but the video um, cameras, somehow, because it's such a distant spot, gives it a ghost around it. So don't pay, pay any attention to the ghost, just believe me that that is, in fact, the, the lighthouse. And, um, uh, as usual, I start with a blank canvas, and here it is. It's a uh, 16 by 20, and the layout is going to be, of course, from scratch. Um, the first thing that I do always is to do a very, very simplified composition. Now, the composition, all landscapes on this planet have got to start with a horizon line somewhere. I'm, I'm choosing a high horizon line because there's so much interesting stuff going on in the foreground. Uh, it doesn't matter if this is shaky a little bit, it should be approximately, well, why don't I just use this, my palette, uh, my palette as a ruler. Uh, uh, th this is a trick that you may want to use, just pick, uh, hold up something straight and, and use it as a ruler with your brush full of colored turpentine because then you don't have to struggle and worry about it being slightly wiggly. Everybody wiggles if you're at arm's length, there is no way of not wiggling. Um, and there is a spit of land, of course, which is, uh, which is just going to be laid out with a very simple, and this line can wiggle because it is bushes and dunes and so on, and that's, uh, that's the second line of the composition. The placement of the lighthouse should be a little bit uh, left of center. Uh, don't center things, it's not good composition. It also pulls the eye to the middle of the canvas, which is, of course, too rigid. So a little bit to the left of the center, which is le left of center, which is where it actually is in this particular composition. Then there is the the introduction of this uh, foliage here, which comes almost to the top of the painting, but it can be it can be laid out in a very in a free manner, just occupying the space of wherever it happens to be. Uh, put it in so that you know where your where your color is going to be going and where your composition is heading. It does not have to be expertly drawn at this point. It, it bisects the horizon line, of course, and then it meets the land. Now the land mass, the land's got a wonderful bunch of really beachy looking things that a lot of people would call gacky and cruddy and cribbly and so on, all the words that come for something that is a little bit spiky a little bit slimy, maybe unknown, but it is flotsam. It's washed up onto the beach. And here is what um, makes this, uh, to me, an interesting composition. First of all, there's a diagonal, and di the diagonal is an important part of any composition. It leads the eye into the picture, and there is the diagonal. 
Um, if this if this line here is confusing to anybody, I'll simply take it out with a piece of paper and some turpentine because I want to make these things absolutely clear. Uh, just because I know exactly what I'm doing doesn't mean that in a demonstration you understand exactly what I'm doing. We found the horizon line, now I've taken it out. Um, the diagonal is important for the introduction of perspective. And then this very... Um, interesting uh, shape of the shoreline. This has happened apparently because of the, the way the waters run and the way the, uh, the, way the tides uh, work and also apparently has got something to do with the bottom surface. The bottom surface of this particular place has got some very uh, interesting patterns on the sand which means that something mysterious is going on down there making for this muddy bank. And then the muddy bank has got seaweed and all sorts of uh, green uh, things, algae and stuff growing, saltwater algae growing. And then the water, of course, comes up and fills on top of that, which makes for the interesting composition that it is. Uh, things happen down here, which, will, which I'll deal with later as the time goes by. But for the most part, here is a composition which, is, which has got one, two, three, four lines in, in reality. There are details, but here is one, two, three, four. If you can decipher a landscape in this manner, you will find yourself uh, with a much easier task than getting terribly perplexed and confused by all the details. Now, as long as I'm talking about details, let me just for a moment show you where the, where the turbulent water the turbulent water comes approximately to here, which is where all those little surface waves take place. And this is my line of reference, somewhere in the middle of this bush arrangement. Now, this bush arrangement comes in two sections. Uh, one of them is in front of the other. So I'm just going to lay that out, but it, for the most part, it is the dark land mass, uh, the dark mass that is over here on the right side of the canvas. Then, of course, as we progress, there are these patterns that find themselves on the beach. There is a, there is a, a, a pile of stuff that's washed up from the, from the water, and then there is some dried seaweed and, and uh, uh, various amounts of uh, indescribable, but rather wonderful looking uh, things that are lying on the beach. So with our close-up camera we'll get to that a little bit later, but here for the most part is the way to start this kind of a composition. I'm going to be doing this in two parts. It'll be part one and part two because it is pointless to even think uh, that I could do uh, any decent kind of a rendering in a half an hour. So uh, part one and part two, hopefully this will be programmed first and you'll see part one first and then the second one will follow. Uh, behind me, by the way, in case anybody was wondering what this enormous picture of roses is, it's a fantasy of mine which is um, maybe delves more into the surrealist. This is called Pearl Harbor, you know, which uh, I, I must explain. Uh, Hawaii is known as the rose uh, in many people's language, rose of the Pacific, hence the roses. And uh, those are Japanese beetles coming out of the great distance uh, there in the sky. And this is the rising sun, obviously to show that they're coming from the, um, from the area of Japan. And they have attacked the roses. Um, it's, um, I did a surrealist show a few years ago, and this is one of the large pieces. And I'm happy to say that it did not sell. Therefore, I have it to be able to show you and to talk to you about it. There's a there's a beetle eating away at the inside of the rose. So um, we painters uh, find some way of expressing ourselves politically, but maybe in um, symbolic terms rather than direct terms. And so yeah, that's the explanation of this painting that you see behind me. All right, let's get to the business of, of applying paint to canvas. This is always uh, where supposedly the fun starts, but it's also where the difficulty starts. The difficulty is naturally the mixing, the, the mixture of color. Um, I'm working with oils, as you may uh, certainly know by now, and I'm going to mix it right on the canvas, pretending that I am out there in the field and that I do not want to schlep a whole bunch of um, extraneous uh, material. First of all, it's too heavy. You have to, you'd have to trudge across the beach with all this stuff. So I'm going to mix it right here on the canvas as I would do were I out of doors. 
Uh, I like to temper the blues of the sky, no matter how pale it is, with some orange because Long Island has its own atmosphere. And at this time of year, the atmosphere tends to be a little bit, well, it's hazy because we're dealing with uh, cool nights and warm days, sometimes lots of sun, and sometimes mists from the ocean. Uh, this is the South Shore, of course, and therefore the ocean is going to give you all those great mists coming in and coloring the atmosphere. I'm putting the paint on with an ordinary, not, well, not so ordinary, it's a red sable brush, it's a square cut brush, and this is my palette. My palette is just uh, another piece of canvas board, which I uh, painted a, d a darker color because white is impossible to work with uh, out of doors as well as in the studio with the TV lights. Uh, so I, um, I believe in using the materials at hand. Nobody needs a $60 uh, palette made out of mahogany and so on. The chances are you'll get it dirty and it'll be probably useless in a very short period of time. But I'm showing you how I'm going to apply this paint. I'm going over the uh, layout because the layout was merely for placement of these objects. I'm also putting in very, very little of what you might call uh, gradations of color. First of all, there weren't any uh, uh, today when we shot this tape. Uh, the, the sky was almost like a, a, a curtain. It was uh, a solid colored curtain. There was not a cloud in the sky, just as I say, the mist. Therefore, it's very, very pale, almost colorless. And uh, those colors are easy to live with in a painting. Uh, I always uh, try to remind people that uh, when they paint a painting or buy one, remember that you will be walking by this uh, object on the wall uh, anywhere from once to 20 times a day. And it had better be uh, pleasing in color or pleasing in form, shape, and general attitude because you're going to look at it so often. Something that maybe a lot of people don't, don't really bother to think too much about when they are either painting or composing a picture. Remember, uh, you're going to live with it and therefore it had better uh, not be intrusive on your life. It had better be an accompaniment to the life, uh, to your daily existence. And, um, the outrageous paintings that you may see in museums and modern uh, exhibitions and so on, I doubt very much are lived with on a daily basis. I'm sure that they're very dramatic and very wonderful to see about what artists are doing today, but I do not believe that people actually live with those huge oversized, over-colorful uh, paintings that are so often shown in magazines and so on. So, I'm going to change the brush. I'm going to very shortly take a very small break, uh, but I'd like to just sort of talk about the, uh, the horizon line, which is so faint, but it is there. I'm going to use a mixture of some phthalo blue, which is a color that I tell everybody to stay away, with, away from, unless you need to make a very wonderful and mysterious mauve purple type of thing. Here's the little puddle of color that I'm using here, and I'm going to try it on the canvas. I mixed it here because my little area for mixing on the canvas is so narrow. I can't mix a large thing. Let's see if this is going to be dark enough to tell me that this is a distant um, a little spit of land that is way off there in the um, in the haze. And it must not be very, it must not be dark. It must tell you by its color that it's really far away. Uh, that is done not only by the fact that it's so narrow, but also by the fact that it has lost most of its color. Remember, this spit of land over here, uh, which is called Fire Island, is um, bushes and green bushes and pale dunes and some darker evergreens, but in the distance it has been reduced to just a narrow band of very pale, almost nondescript color, bluish mauve sort of thing. This is what happens when you are observing the scene instead of making it up out of your memory. The lighthouse, uh, as I said to you earlier, is a black and white structure. I'm sure that everybody is very familiar with it. It is, uh, it is so far away that, that, that it may not show too clearly on this pale background, except that it has a shadow. Um, and the shadow is going to be very, very pale, not dark because it's so far away. And it will merely tell you that the sun is in the west 
over that away. But it also, sh I should also be able to tell you that there are stripes in this uh, lighthouse so that it can in fact be identified by anybody who happens to see it. It has, it has to be very subtly done. You don't need much more than that to tell the story. But around it, there are some silhouetted buildings that are also going to be, that are also going to be uh, colorless, actually. And um, uh, I believe one of them has got a uh, pointed roof here. That's the, uh, oh, I think it's that's the keeper's lighthouse. And then another little one over here. But they are very pale. However, they must go in. This is the identifying uh, feature of this particular scene. A lot of people who would see this, and, and if you didn't put these buildings in, you just put the lighthouse, they'd say, but aren't there buildings around the lighthouse? And of course, the answer to that is yes, there are. But they can be totally indistinct as long as their presence is known over there and as long as it blends into the background. That's all you need. That's what you call a painterly approach to, um, to oil painting. Just a suggestion. Nobody expects to put the windows into those buildings. Um, that's what makes it uh, really mysterious because when you step away from it, you'd swear there was a building there, but when you get close to it, you see there's nothing but a couple of blobs of paint that don't seem to mean very much of anything. Um, the water then, of course, is the next uh, phase because I work from the background towards the foreground. The water in, on Long Island tends sometimes to be not as blue as you would find in uh, in the uh, Caribbean islands or the Greek islands, but they are our color. Well, I'll get back to that in just a moment. Let me take a very short break. Uh, I'll be right back. Here we are back again, and the water. That's the point of painting Long Island scenes. I think that you must really admit that you have to have water if it's a Long Island scene. We are, after all, only a few miles wide, a few miles long, but we're dead center of a, two huge bodies of water. So that's one of the reasons that I like to paint this here place so well. Uh, water is a mysterious, wonderful element that is apparently found only here on this planet. Therefore, I am drawn to it. Now, the water near the uh, shoreline, way off there in the distance, seems to be rather pale in places. It's going to be able to tell us the, the space, the um, rather the difference in color between the land and the water. But then it becomes turbulent in the middle, and it assumes some other colors because the turbulence has called, caused little waves, and guess what little waves have? Little waves have shadows, and um, the shadows make it appear to be darker. So with this very sh um, narrow band of light color here, uh, and I think that when we all step back, we'll see that these subtle tones that may not be uh, easily picked up on the television screen will work uh, later. Uh, let's hope. Let's hope they do. The blues that I'm going to obtain here, oddly enough, have got uh, some reds in them. Uh, red and uh, uh, cobalt blue uh, make for, in my opinion, the right tone of 
a colorless water uh, that you find on Long Island at this time of year. This, by the way, is the perfect time of year to go out there and paint this place. It is, the weather is, uh, could not be better. It's just cool enough to be able to stand and stay, I mean, stand, stay in the sun for a period of time without having your brains boil. And also, you don't die of thirst, and uh, the, the people are out, and, uh, and activity seems to be are really uh, very prevalent. Instead of just lying on the beach like a poor fried oyster, you are out there enjoying the remarkable quality of the air at this time of year. So this is the best time, in my opinion, to go out there and do it. Well, we have here, and it doesn't look like very much, but it's going to tell the story in just a minute. Let me pick up another brush and give some feeling about the uh, just the illusion of some disturbances back there that are caused either by small boats or bigger boats or just maybe the wind on the surface. But out here in the middle, where it's slightly choppy, uh, you could probably say that this is because there is a, a flat land out there. Maybe it's a little bit shallow. Either that, or maybe there are, in fact, deep places where the water is being disturbed. But definitely out here, there is, uh, there, there is surface disturbance with little wavelets, uh, all very important to the, um, the anatomy of this particular body of water. Um, uh, there was not as much activity out there uh, today as there would have been in the dead of summer with these huge charter boats and people hanging over the side with 150 lines of fishing cord into the water, but today it was quite wonderful and uh, people were having the best time. Um, I'm approaching the land now and uh, the water is going to get quite pale. As a matter of fact, almost as pale as the sky, maybe just about as pale as the sky, which means that there's a lot of a tremendous amount of white in this color, which is going to give it its brilliance. Now that choppy part there uh, sudden, suddenly stops and it becomes, it smooths out, flattens out and becomes almost like a reflecting pool. This, um, this is what makes uh, painting this place so f such great uh, interest to me because you never really know what it's going to look like until you get out there. That's why I'm really deploring the idea of some of the programs that are on that tell you just go ahead and just set up something in your house and start putting paint on canvas without observing anything. It's not possible to get what you might enjoy seeing if you have not observed it. So it's almost like uh, saying to everybody, I'm going to go and see a Broadway show and I'll come back and I'll tell you about it. It. and uh, you're supposed to get as much enjoyment out of it as if you had gone. Can't work. What you have to do is to be there to record this and be able to get the whole flavor of it as you do it. Uh, here is the brilliant part of the, um, of, the, of the water as it approaches the viewer, as it's becoming, as it's getting closer to shore, and it is in fact becoming slightly darker darker as it comes near and this is where oils come into play this is where where you can begin to blend colors very subtly as they do in in scenes such as this in nature the blends are extremely subtle my chair seems to be i get so um i get so much movement that the chair goes with me um uh, but a chair, um, believe me, in a, is uh, probably a lot more comfortable than a, s a sand or a hard boardwalk. Uh, this, uh, as you can see, as we get, as I'm getting closer to the uh, to the land this water is getting darker. I'm however going to reserve some of this until a bit later so that I can, before this program is over, so that I can introduce the uh, foliage that is the, one of the things, one of the intrigues of living near the sea and where you have um, uh, green things growing on sand spits and dunes and so on right by the sea. Uh, here I've laid this out and uh, the uh, technique of doing uh, bushes has got to be done with deliberate strokes. You cannot fill a brush full of color and then simply say, well, I guess that looks pretty good and hope that, th so hope that it works. You must be deliberate about it and you must be observant. You must see the anatomy of that tree and see what that tree, why that tree looks like it does or whatever it is that it is. Maybe it's not a tree. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a strange evergreen bush. Maybe it's a damson plum. Maybe it's 
it's a cedar that has gotten uh, seeded out there and has been bent with the wind. So the observation of these particular things are going to tell you where you are. Long Island is very specific in its uh, undergrowth and I must say that I find that missing in many of the uh, studies of this place that the uh, painters have not been observant about what it is that's growing out there. They think that maybe uh, just a bunch of uh, dune grass uh, uh, bending in the wind is enough. It isn't. You've got to make sure that you understand what the foliage and what the flora is of this place that we have chosen to live on. And um, I think that with that, uh, or only when you're out there to observe it, can you uh, begin to understand what it is that's out there. So. Uh, even though uh, it is intimidating, I suppose, to some to go out into the environment and to work from life, uh, I have said for an awfully long time that all the information is there. All you have to do is to go and transfer it to your canvas. Well, now that's an over oversimplification, I know, and I'm chided sometimes for saying you make it sound too simple, but actually it's true. The information is there for you to see. You don't have to rely upon remembering it. So that's, that's my shtick, as they say. So, uh, a mixture of some burnt sienna, a little bit of sap green, some deliberate brush strokes, uh, and then the, uh, the information here that with this dark area, I'm going to be able to introduce a very light area uh, of, of bushes um, against it. And the sun is catching it, and therefore I think that you'll see that preparation like this is uh, vital for you to understand how to go about this. Um, Needless to say, time, of course, is uh, speeding along as it usually does, but I, uh, I think that maybe with enough of this done, you'll be able to arouse enough interest to come back the next time and see uh, how you, uh, the denouement, as you might say if you were writing a novel, the denouement of this little piece, this little 16 by 20 canvas, which began as a blank uh, surface, a blank flat place, and now trying to transfer it optically um, by applying paint in a uh, very deliberate and very uh, observed manner. Let me find my other brush and uh, and show you the way I'm going to, uh, for the next time, really pay attention to the way the branches of this um, of this growth of stuff uh, works here. Let me, let me pull some of this sky in here and cover that up. Uh, the finger is, uh, is is allowed if you um, if you make sure that you keep your your uh, canvas from getting all smudgy and smudgy up. Here are some of these branches have, uh, these branches have uh, apparently lost their, um, their uh, foliage, you know, either through the, the, the death of the branch or winter time or uh, anything else that might have taken place. But this is one of, one of the intriguing things about um, uh, objects such as this, that you can't possibly imagine that this is the way this is going to look, that this gnarled little thing is, is um, clinging to life on the edge of the cap tree boat basin in uh, in Long Island. Um, I, I like to find these things that are um, that are sort of off uh, off the beaten track. I, I think that the silhouetted pine tree against the sky is fine, but I like to see these objects uh, and maybe a dead branch or a little dead thing sticking up here into the sky to show you that uh, this, there are no longer any leaves on it. But it's what makes it interesting and what makes it unique for this island because these are, uh, these are found uh, only on this island, I believe. Well, um, I have certainly talked enough uh, for a half an hour, I think. I hope that while I was talking, you watched and I was able to get something across to you. Uh, if I did, all to the good. Otherwise, if you missed something, tune in the next time that you see this program advertised and maybe you'll run into part two of the Cap Tree Boat Basin study. And thanks for watching. This is Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel. Bye-bye.